Hey everybody, welcome back to Equity Guru. I've got Mike Steer from Saga Metals here. Mike is in the third day since IPO, so he's got a smile on his face uh, rather than the furrow brow that he's had for the last year. Uh, Mike, welcome to the world of public markets. How's it feeling? Yeah, thanks, Chris. Great, great to talk to you again today. Uh, it's it's feeling great. You know, it was a bit of a lead up there to uh, to getting through the IPO, but uh, first few days of trading have been going well, and we've got numerous catalysts uh, to discuss over the next uh, you know several months here as far as uh, news releases go. You know, while we are kind of wrapping up our, our summer programs, uh, that doesn't mean that the news flow is going to stop. If anything, it's actually going to ramp up pretty pretty intensively over the next few months and um, you know we try not to focus too much on on the uh, short-term uh, trading whether it be minute by minute or day, day by day here um, only in the short term here mainly because I think this is a great entry point for uh, you know future investors and there's a lot lot that we have going on and um, working with Michael Garrigan our chief geological officer to put all of that together and start putting it out to uh, to the world to see so you you've decided to come out the blocks not with with one resource to to target not two but five you've got uranium you've got lithium you've got titanium vanadium iron and it's all out in the maritimes uh you haven't done the the me too thing and just plopped down in saskatchewan like everybody else what, what attracted you to that part of the world and uh what's the the general uh thinking behind all of those critical minerals yeah, I mean, I think for us, it was very important to put together a diversified portfolio of critical minerals. Having five um, is definitely something within our purview, and, and we're able to kind of advance uh, strategically. We do have our flagship property, which is the uranium asset, and we'll slowly move forward um, the iron ore and titanium vanadium projects. Of course, we've done our Rio Tinto partnership, um, the lithium asset, which kind of takes care and makes us a bit passive on the lithium side of things right now. But leaving it in the hands of a company such as that is, is obviously, um, you know, the best thing that we could have done uh, given the current uh, state of the market. But you, um, you yeah, couldn't so possibly have got a, a, a bigger, more respected partner for that for that asset. No, de definitely not. I mean, Rio Tinto is obviously uh, one of the largest um, mining and exploration companies in the world, and um, we're super excited to have them on board. And uh, they're they're actually currently on on our property right now, uh, conducting their their second field program. So looking forward to getting an update from them on what they're observing on the ground and and putting a news release out in the coming weeks. As as far as uh, that's concerned, your average retail investor looks at lithium and thinks, eh, uh, right now, uh, because of the general macro economic outlook for it. But to have attracted a, a partner of that size to your lithium property really indicates that there's. A future there there's, there's something there that, that those guys have done their due diligence on and think is is super interesting yeah i mean i think the benefit for us is that a company like you know rio tinto they're wanting to find these discoveries on their own um you know of course they could go in and probably buy patriot battery metals tomorrow if they wanted to but they think that there's a lot of perspective ground um you know not only across the world but specifically in in james bay and the lithium district that we find ourselves in it's becoming one of the most important hard rock lithium districts in the world. And, um, you know, they're doing their due diligence to find these projects so they can move these grassroots projects forward and, and you know, find and discover and, and develop a mine on their own. So for us to do a $44 million two-stage earn-in option agreement with them made the most sense for us. You know, they're not concerned about short-term lithium prices. And, and to be honest, neither are we. They have a much longer time horizon when they look at it. Um, it, it does, of course, help when you've got um, uh, Chinese companies such as um, cattle that's uh, reducing their production. Um, it it kind of just puts a little bit of a, a boost in the marketplace to, uh, you know, signify that uh, the supply is going to be much needed elsewhere. Not to mention the fact that, you know, obviously North American companies are trying to um, shore up their own supplies of, of lithium. So, again, just more importantly... We're passive on the lithium side, allowing Rio Tinto to do what they're doing. It allows us to focus on our other projects. We didn't do our deal based on the price of lithium. We did our deal based on, on the prospective nature of our property, given our, our geological um, footprint, as well as um, you know what's going on in the eastern part of James Bay with respect to the other notable projects in the area that we happen to be contiguous with in a, in a structural trend. And the, that deal with uh, the big boys also gave you a little bit of financing that you can put towards the uranium project, right? 
Hundred percent. Yeah, they've already um, given us our first payment of four hundred ten thousand uh, dollars Canadian. It was received a few weeks ago, and, and it's been a great uh, addition to the treasury as as we've been moving forward um, our programs uh, on our other properties while we were waiting to close out the IPO, which we just did on on September twenty third. So a lot of companies, a lot of exploration companies, uh, they hit the exchange, they do the RTO thing because it's quick. Uh, they they get out there and start pumping, and the big deals with the big boys come down the line. Uh, you established your legitimacy before you even were tradable. Uh, was that a, uh, a a strategy or just the way things fell? I think it's just kind of how how timing worked. I think it's also just sort of a, a testament to what we're trying to do from a corporate standpoint. Like being public really had nothing to do with us trying to advance these projects and and build shareholder value. I mean, even at that point, we already had you know forty some odd shareholders, so there's always a reason to be building and creating value within the organization. But timing was really, um, I, I guess, the factor in, in terms of. Uh, you know, we had just obtained our results from two, three week programs that we did last summer. We put together a data room and, and we reached out to some of these other notable companies in the area as more advancements were occurring by these other companies that were contiguous to us in Eastern James Bay. So, you know, it just all kind of came together appropriately. And, and really, it, it's just that's something that we did as a, as a private company, but it's also something that we're going to be doing as a public company. You know, there's, there's no short of, of major uh, companies nearby, even with respect to some of our other projects like our uranium project. We've got Paladin Energy that's about three kilometers north of us. Um, that, you know, same thing as we advance our project, we'll reach out to these bigger companies and just start letting them know who we are and what we're doing. And it's exactly what we did with Rio Tinto and, and the partnership came along. So. I always think that it's it's a great sign when a small company has due diligence done on them by a much larger company that has lawyers and accountants and people to dig in much deeper than you or I uh, and give you the thumbs up. Uh, you know, in an industry where there are a lot of ne'er-do-wells, it's, it's nice to have someone go through all of your trash and think, yeah, you know, these guys are not just good enough to do a little business with, but a lot of business with. Absolutely. It, it's definitely a rigorous process. I mean, you know, even at the outset, when everyone seems to be friendly in, in the uh, conversations and, and kind of sets the tone for trying to do a kind of quote unquote, you know, quick transaction, it always ends up taking more time than you think, because there is the necessary level of due, due diligence required um, to, to complete something of this nature, especially with a company as large as Rio Tinto. And you know, we moved through the process as, um, as appropriately as we, as we did. And um, at the end of the day, we, we got it done because they were able to validate what it is that uh, we currently have, where we are, and sort of what's going on. And, and obviously, um, it's a testament to the fact that uh, they're on the ground right now. Like they're eager to get out there and get it done, and off we go. So super excited to see what they find. And uh, we're right there working with them in a technical committee capacity to, uh, to review you know, their programs and the results and all that kind of stuff. So we'll, we'll be sharing all those details with shareholders as, as it comes to us, for sure. Does, does that deal elevate your status in certain boardrooms when you're dealing with brokers and deal guys and family offices and potential investors? It certainly helps. I mean, it, it validates, obviously, management's ability to find these projects. And, and I'll, I'll throw the um, kudos to Michael Garrigan, our, our chief geological officer, who I just... Couldn't be doing this without him. I mean, his he's a, been a 15-year exploration geologist, um, comes from a family of geologists, and uh, he just he knows how to find this stuff. I mean, we're in Labrador because it's one of the most overlooked jurisdictions, um, not only in Canada, but probably arguably the world. It's one of the best jurisdictions to be in. Um, definitely a, a favorable provincial government and local communities as far as what it is that we're doing and the ore bodies that we're trying to go after. And it's just been extremely overlooked. They had Boise's Bay um, excitement, obviously, back in 94, 95, and that kind of fell off when the Briex scandal occurred. And then you had a massive uranium rush back between 2006 and 2008. Um, and then that kind of fell off when they put a moratorium on for three years. But they only did it because they didn't really know they had uranium in the province. No one had really rushed in to do exploration for uranium in Labrador before. And so when that came on, they just hadn't had time to develop their policies and talk to local communities 
anyways, that lasted three years. They did lift it. They're obviously, uh, you know, pro uranium moving forward, but uranium kind of had a hard time. Fukushima occurred at that point and uranium prices hit, hit rock bottom. But when you kind of put it into perspective, this province has only had those two major rushes. It's got the same Archean rocks, the same Canadian shield as Quebec and Ontario. And you just have to ask yourself, where are the mines? It, it's not because they're not there or they don't have the potential to be there. Yeah. It's, it's just a major overlooked jurisdiction. And, and Michael Gerrigan's done a fantastic job of sourcing out the projects that we have. It's also a testament to how we've been able to keep our cap structure so tight in terms of the deals that we've made or the claims that we've staked directly from the government. So now we're, we're super excited to be in Labrador and, and we think that we're on to something special in, in that jurisdiction for sure. And, and you know the first big discovery that the, the gates are going to open to all the people that have uh, me too out in and in the prairies. Ab absolutely, I mean, it's more and more of, of what we're doing and, and what some of the other companies are doing in the area. Then you'll start to get another another rush, I'm sure, in, yeah. in there. But for now, we've uh, it, we've kind of got uh, it's open for us to uh, to pick at while uh, no one else is paying attention. Amazing. Sure. Is, is uh, the strategy to continue looking for opportunities for, for more assets or is it to get boots on the ground and really gear up what you've got? Yeah. So, we're, I mean, we're pretty focused on our projects right now. Um, you know, as, as I mentioned, Michael Garrigan being in the field um, on the, on the uranium project, there's just a lot, lot to do uh, with the projects that we have. But with that being said, you know, you're always kind of in, in QGIS, which is an exploration software program that we use for uh, tracking all of our data and whatnot. So it's obviously hard not to come across different opportunities and things like that. And we'll always keep keep our eyes and ears open. Um, but for now, we're very much focused on advancing our current projects for sure. Good enough. So I know that you're going to have a, a lot of news planned over the next three to six months. Uh, part of that is going to be uh, assays of, of what you found on properties. I know you can't say much, uh, but I, I wonder how big your smile is on, on the expectation of what you're going to find. Yeah, for sure. So, I mean, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll start by sort of saying that I, I actually just got back from Labrador myself. Um, I'm, I'm based uh, just outside of Vancouver in British Columbia. So I, I spent last week in Labrador with Michael Garrigan on uh, two of our properties, uh, the titanium vanadium project, uh, it's called the radar project, and then our uranium project, which is the double Merc project. And um, I, I can tell you, I, I was like a little kid running around a playground out there. Like it, it was, it was pretty exciting. I mean, I had um, Michael Garrigan on the, on the radar titanium vanadium project had all had already been there in July. And um you know, last year, if you look at our maps, we had a zone called the Hawkeye zone that was identified. It's about a three and a half kilometer by 500 meter zone. You know, we were hitting about uh, almost 7% titanium and then almost 4,000 ppm vanadium. And we had come across some, some geophysics um, from a local prospector and it was kind of highlighting some other anomalies uh, to the west of our Hawkeye zone. We've now aptly dubbed it the, uh, the trapper zone. And so he's already kind of, it's running about four kilometers, four and a half kilometers right now. And there's this zone that he hadn't gotten to yet. That's just south that would kind of show that it's extending. Anyways, he flew me around the property and, and we, we checked out some of the zones he'd already been to, showed me this amazing part where, where you know, you talk about a textbook layered mafic intrusion and they, they pulled apart all the cover and exposing the rock and you can see the layers perfectly defined in the rock. It's actually really cool to see. Um, so anyways, after he had finished showing me all of that, I said, Hey, let, let's go up to that, that zone that you haven't been to yet and let's check it out. And so we, we went, we had our, our rock hammer and, and all that kind of stuff. And, um, you know, I started pulling back some of the cover and chipping off the rock. Even the pilot got involved and he was, he was in there digging away. And, you know, of course, you chip off some of the rock and you have what's called a magnet pen. It's what you're using um, to kind of discern whether there's magnetite in, in, in the rock or not. It's going to be magnetic. And so we take the rock and you stick the pen to it. They would just, it would just dangle there, um, you know, free, free um, hang from the rock. And so anyways, I chipped off one Mike's Mike's sitting there writing, writing his sample card out, bagging and tagging it. Well, I'm, I'm running off to, <laughs> down the way banging off some more rocks and he just had to follow my trail as I was kind of running through. And obviously we have to wait for the assay results of those, uh, you know, about 10 additional samples that, uh, that we had taken, but 
just based on the magnet pen, you know there's magnetite uh, in, in that rock. And so it's extremely exciting um, to see that that zone very much extends. And so I, I'm really looking forward. The, the assay results on, on the other samples that we've already released um, in our previous news release are, are now just trickling in. So I'm very excited to be able to uh, release those in the next, call it week or two. Um, and then on the uranium property, we went, we went to that property the next day and a um, little bit of a different thing. Obviously it's, it's not, you don't have a, a magnet pen because you're, you're not looking for uh, anything that's magnetic. You're looking for uranium obviously. And so you use what's called a scintillometer uh, which is detecting the radiation levels in the ground. So when you see in our news releases, we talk about counts per second or CPS. That's the readings that we're getting off of this machine. And so it makes a, a sound like kind of a, just sort of like a ringing sound. And when you start to get to, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten, and, and above thousand CPS, uh, it just it just goes off like a, a really high pitch sort of scream almost. And same thing, like I'm running, I'm just, I'm running around there checking out all these different rocks as this thing's just screaming at me, um, especially in this, in this one area to the Western side, like literally everywhere I ran back and forth. Um, it was just, it was super cool to be able to be out there and, and see it for myself and be able to come back and, and just report uh, that level of excitement based on the observation. I could see the uranophane right on the rocks myself, which again, for, for those that don't know, uranophane is essentially the oxidization of uranium minerals hosted within the pegmatite. So all very encouraging things. Um, those rock samples were dropped off about a week ago. And so I, I expect those assay results to be forthcoming over the next, uh, you know, three, four weeks kind of thing. So lot, lots to talk about for sure. Quick timeline. So you're, you're hitting the ground running and, uh, and the scintometer is screaming and it's, it's, I'll tell you, like, as you were going through the process of going public, you know, sitting down with you on a zoom call, you're very sort of furrowed brow and very, you know, I've got a lot of stuff to do and let's get through it. And, and you, the smile on your face right now after playing with the rocks is, <laughs> is definitely notable. Uh, yeah. so this is, it's just, I love it when a plan comes together and it looks like saga is really coming together right now. Yeah, I, absolutely. I, I couldn't be more thrilled that we're finally public. Um, you know, you, you always get that from people as you go through the process of, you know, oh, you know, when, when is it going to happen? What's the date? When are you going to be trading? Is it, you know, and, and so we just, I don't have, we don't have to deal with that anymore. We're public, we're here, we're out there and we've just got so much stuff on the go. It's, it's, it's going to be exciting. So amazing. Well, man, I appreciate your time and, and we'll talk again soon uh, and keep making sure people know of your progress because with the the way the general market is out there right now, there's a there's a lot of CEOs buying rope uh, and uh, it, it's always good when a story starts to really uh, ratchet things up. Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, the, the other, uh, I guess, note I'll leave you with um, before, before we sign off here is that while it is exciting what's going on on our property specifically, I think it's important to know kind of just what's happening in the industry. I'll keep it specific to, to uranium um, at this point in time, but I'm not sure if you saw, but you've got Constellation Energy and Microsoft that are working together to bring Three Mile Island back online which is not only significant, just highlighting the fact that from an AI perspective, they're just understanding that it requires so much energy to run these. And it, it's definitely a space that's not slowing down. They need to find clean, renewable energy. And the fact that they're bringing back online a power plant that was arguably, well, it was the it largest- the industry for a while. Um, Yeah, it was the largest uranium catastrophe in the US just kind of highlights the shift right now that we're seeing um, for the acceptance of the uranium moving forward. That was just, I think, a, a very pivotal move. You know, you're seeing a lot of things happen with uranium companies specifically, but you get a company like Microsoft that's bringing that online. Um, that, that's, I think, just something that's a huge testament to the industry. Um, not to mention, too, you've got um, the Chinese government just announcing a massive stimulus package that not only is a is a catalyst driving uh, commodities of, of all kinds, not just uranium, but it, it just again further supports the movement that's that's occurring uh, within the resource sector in general. Um, and then you've got you know on the heels of, of announcement that fourteen um, major banks and financial institutions around the world are supporting um, essentially uranium clean energy, bringing on nuclear power plants or small modular reactors. 
um, trying to triple the the capacity by 2025 with uh, about 22 different company or sorry companies countries uh, supporting this movement. And so again, just a lot of things in the industry going on from a uranium perspective. And I, I think our timing for what we're seeing on the Dubmer property um, and, and just the advancements we hope to make on there, getting into a drill program, uh, heading into the winter. It's just, it's very exciting. Just all things coming together. Our company standpoint, macro environment, industry standpoint, lots, lots forthcoming. Amazing. Well, so we, we've, we've got it covered in the three months, the six months and six years. All good Absolutely. stuff. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right, man. Well, let's talk again soon. Sounds great. Thanks. Chris. That's Mike Steer from Saga Metals. Uh, S-A-G-A is your ticker symbol. Uh, go out and add it to your watch list and keep an eye on what's going on.